Okay, do you guys have the agenda up in the middle of the screen? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Did you think it was your? <laughs> yes, the agenda. I thought it was my copy. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. There we go. Ms. Fisher, you're seeing the same thing we're seeing, so it's all good. Okay, okay. I had it up before when I printed it out, and I thought, oh, yeah. it's stuck on there. <laughs> Technology is not my strongest point. We're all learning every, every all the time. Uh, every day, I know. Yep. So I just got a ring doorbell, and now I need to take it off the bracket to um, charge it up, and it it won't come off. So Did you I'll get probably, the I'll call Todd Everly. He'll save me. He lives there right be a screw, the Just a screw at the bottom of it. Is it? Yeah. I don't want to mess it up. How is everybody? <laughs> Good. And you guys have been working hard and it's been a long day for you too. Wow, got a lot of great stuff going on. So we're excited. Yeah. Get to see Mr. Uh, Mr. Molloy tonight. I know, my one of my former mediators, <laughs> yes. captain of the peace team. <laughs> I like the guys actually called it the peace team. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, we had fun with that. We were more of a symbolic force. I think just the fact that we had a peace team, it really kept the, the disputes to a very small number. Thank you for that testimonial. <laughs> so, you know, Adam, today when I was listening to Lori and uh, uh, Jen and the team presenting, I was thinking, yeah, you know, we used to do all this stuff, but we didn't have specific names for it and nobody made a rule to make us do it. And it worked. And then we kind of got away from it for a while. And and here we are today. So full circle. All right, Marissa, we'll mute ourselves and we'll let you get started. All right. OK, so we're going to go ahead and get started. It's officially 6.02. Um, and welcome. Uh, everybody kind of gave a, a little bit of an in introduction um is there anybody that is brand new that has not joined us before i don't know if there is i know sometimes we might say it in the chat i'm pulling up the chat and there's nothing in there um okay all right so our first thing on our uh, agenda for today is the reading and approval of our uh, of our agenda for today which is january 25th 2021 and candace has it up on the shared screen here. So just go ahead and roll on down and read through that. Everybody good? Okay. Um, so we've reviewed the agenda. Um, a motion to approve. Yes. Good. We need a motion to approve on that. I'll motion. Uh, I, I'm, I move to approve the minutes. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So our reading and approval of minutes from our last meeting, which was November 30th. Um, so I know that's up here as well. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and scroll through that. Oh, we've got a person in here. All right, uh, now that we've all looked through that, a motion to approve our minutes from November 30th. Anyone? I think I did, didn't I? Judy? E yes. Um, okay. Um, I can second. Awesome. 
So we'll go ahead and bring our agenda for today back up. There we go. All right. Um, okay. So a reviewing of our mission statement and our purpose of the committee. Scroll on up to that. Awesome. All right. So our mission statement to advise the school board by recommending approaches to obtaining improved student achievement for all students through a coherent, rigorous academic course of study that provides the tools necessary to succeed in today's society. Emphasis will be placed on the dynamic development of a K-12 curriculum within a safe environment, leading both to, the, to both career and technical majors, the methods of instruction used to implement it and the assessments of its effectiveness together with a, comp with a complementary professional development program to support it. All right. And then next, is there any public comment? Anyone from the public or just, a, just another comment? I don't believe so. I don't think we have anybody on. I didn't think so either. Okay. All right. Okay. So next up is our board member reports, which is presented by Ms. Mary Fisher. Is she on? She is here, right? You're muted, Ms. Fisher. He's there. There she is. <laughs> okay. There. Now, can you hear me? We can. Okay. <laughs> this, this is okay. So um, I, when reading the minutes from the last meeting, um, this update might have been a little bit more appropriate for, for that, but I can use it as a follow up. <clears throat> I know that you heard some about what uh, schools are doing with positive behavior support and um, restorative practices and a lot of the other um, a curriculum that's used at elementary to uh, help kids. We know that um, student success uh, is our main goal. And what we are really looking at here is that in order to be ready to learn, kids have to be safe, healthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, and ready to engage. <clears throat> so our student services team at the district have really put in a lot of work in response to uh, additional funding from the CARES Act, which provides uh, additional mental health professional assistance for our families, and um, presenting the curriculum in a, an organized fashion through Wellness Wednesdays. And I do want to say that the curriculum for that uh, was purchased, and I, I know additional lessons are being created by the team down there to uh, better meet the needs of our own kids and a K-1-2 um, curriculum in response to the Florida laws for substance abuse prevention uh, has been created by our um, uh, Alicia Roy, our master health teacher, and the rest of the team in student services, counseling, and mental health. So I'm really proud of the work that they've been doing because that's kind of my bailiwick as a former student services person. And <clears throat> some of the other things that they have done, uh, and I'm just gonna, you probably have heard about Kids Minds Matter. So we do a lot of community partnerships and cooperative and collective efforts with um, different agencies. And that's been very helpful. But while we continue to collaborate to address mental health care for youth, um, according to Kids Minds Matter, they were very alarmed by the fact that pediatric emergency room Baker Acts at Golisano Hospital, so that's just our own Lee County, are up 66% by the end of the fall of 2020. And wait times to get help for people, uh, those appointments can take up to a year to come to fruition. So they did uh, appeal to the local media to tell the story about the needs of kids and families and how we are impacted by kids' mental health um, problems. So what they're doing is doing public service announcements and sharing um, the resources available to help families and soliciting help from more and more of our resources. 
And as the states continues to become more aware of the impact of the issues, they have been funding us and we continue to ask them in our legislative priorities for funding for these very serious needs. So at the district level, um, the Florida National Guard presents night vision presentations. And I don't know, some of you may have seen those when you were in high school and they're pretty compelling and it really helps kids at all levels to have a better understanding of how important it is to stay drug free. So those numbers of the kids showing up in the pediatric intensive care are um, ingestions, suicide attempts, and you know, mostly drug overdoses. And that, that is a problem because the ages of those kids can be as young as eight and up to 17. So we're talking about a very um, significant and um, tender part of our, our school population. <clears throat> so we continue to work with our agencies such as Cells Care, Hanley Center, Florida Gulf Coast University, and the more that they're out there, the, the more help um, is coming forward. So Healthy Minds was created mostly to help adults in crisis. But as we've had people, professionals out at local uh, places like farmers markets and um, events in front of shopping centers and um, different little fairs and uh, concerts, we have been able to reach some families. And I was interested the first time I volunteered to see when the adults that showed up had kids in tow because the kids were embarrassed to talk about it at school. So the parents brought them to this place where their school peers were not. And so we've been able to get a significant help for 75 families in Lee County and even more in Collier. So I really think that as we look at positive behavior support, positive prevention, we have to really recognize the importance of that and how that does set the stage for a kid's academic achievement. Uh, I've been a long time involved with the Drug-Free Coalition and so this Saturday, they're having a run for prevention, which is how they get their money for Drug House Odyssey and other prevention programs that they provide to our school district free of charge. Um, the run is at JC Park in Cape Coral. And of course, families and pets are welcome. And um, it starts at uh, eight o'clock on Saturday and it's suitable for all ages and abilities. And it's gonna be a great day. So. Come on out. Then um, the Southwest Florida Teen Leadership Council is presenting a town hall meeting in February on the 17th. And this is a collaborative effort um, pulling teens together to see what is, is going on with them. Because I think it's extremely important that we listen to the kids and get their input so that we can continue with our planning with some uh, real real specific goals and focus in mind. Teens have very real concerns and anxiety right now about social unrest and all the current events. So they're, they're very concerned about how this is gonna affect their ability to finish high school and get into college or um, career training. And so they invite you to submit questions during the program in the chat box. It'll be live on Facebook on the Drug-Free Coalition Prevention Parents Facebook page. Um, let's see. And the Healthy League uh, Lifestyle Coalition continues to meet with us and partner with uh, the agencies who partner with us and include us in their efforts to help our community become a more healthy place by encouraging good nutrition and exercise. So basically, that's been my part of the um, strategic plan imp implementation. And I've um, really enjoyed the collaborations and the relationships that we've built. And I see it really starting to make um, a significant difference in uh, um, services that are available to our kids and teachers to help with having those 
Um, when I worked in student services, our director, um, Dr. Charles Bell used to say, you know, we have to remove the barriers to learning. And these things are barriers to learning. So I think that the better job our district team is doing in facilitating that, uh, the more you guys can do your job and help them pull it through and be successful academically. So I wanna thank you all for the work you do and for the attention you're giving me tonight. Thank you. I hope I didn't go over my five. I can't, Marissa, you're muted. Sorry about that. No, you're good. All right, so. I'm looking at trying to back All right, there we go. I was looking for the agenda. There it is. All right, so um, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Fisher. And we'll go to our proximity plan, which is presented by Adam Malloy. Thank you guys so much for having me and uh, good evening. And thanks board member Fisher for that update. Uh, so tonight we have um, we have the new student assignment plan, and I am going to uh, to share my screen, uh, and then in kind of go through the presentation, and then hopefully be able to answer any questions or comments or feedback uh, that you might have. Uh, your group's importance as it relates to the input that you provide uh, for curriculum, I think is um, you know I think is is extremely significant. And it, it combines with a process like this, which is ultimately deciding uh, what choices students have and where they will be going to school. Uh, so combining those two together to ensure that each student reaches his or her highest potential is uh, is a great match. So I'm going to share my screen and, and walk you guys through a little bit of the project, uh, the why, the history, the future, um, and all, all the in-between. Can everybody see that? You can, yes. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Spiro. Uh, so my name is Adam Malloy, coordinator of community engagement. Uh, I am a member of the technical working team uh, added on um, right around the start of the fall uh, to the new student assignment plan. Um, now this new student assignment plan uh, has a lot of potential. Uh, we are working through a lot of the processes and the accompanying policies um, to go with this new plan. And it is just for elementary school uh, starting with the 2022-2023 school year. You know, the why, and when I was thinking about the why, I wanted to go big for you guys because I really have a, I have a lot of passion for a project like this. Um, the last time we remodeled the student assignment plan similar, uh, similar to the scope of what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here uh, was about 15, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and that was at the last year of the five-year supervisory period um, when we were granted unitary status in 1999, we were removed from the federal uh, desegregation order. Um, and then we had five years of supervisory. And then after that, the plan went into effect, which were these large geographic zones broken down into subzones, uh, and students could choose from the subzone schools that they, that they reside in, uh, and also an adjacent subzone. Um, but the why for this for me is that when you're ultimately uh, dictating and deciding via a structure or a system where a student attends school, you are impacting their, uh, their outcomes. Uh, so both their life outcomes uh, and their academic outcomes. So regardless of how technical uh, boundary uh, changes sound or policy companions, uh, the heart of this is, is that we are impacting where students will be attending school uh, and, and why they will be attending school there. So this new student assignment plan is coming online. Um, in essence, we are moving towards uh, what people from the Midwest or Northeast would call community schools, but we add a plus to it because we are still maintaining choice. Uh, we will be impacting travel. Uh, there will be a lot less travel. Uh, we will have stronger choices closer to home. Um, and hopefully as a result of the accompanying policies, uh, the programming, the resourcing, the staffing, uh, better outcomes uh, for our students. Um, so I have in here kind of like a tree of uh, learning and community and family. And I think that, that ultimately the, the plan can get there. Um, and it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of us uh, on this call 
uh, to move this forward. So I'm, I am really excited about being, being on the team and having a seat at the table. Um, my background research has been on student assignment plans and our local student assignment plan history. Um, and so that's, uh, that's kind of why I'm, why I'm here and, you know, hopefully, hopefully able to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, as I mentioned, our history, our current plan has been in place uh, since 2005, 2006. That's, you know, our large geographic zones, east, south, and west, uh, broken into uh, primarily nine subzones. Now, we do have three um, barrier island subzones, but I don't really include those because there's not a lot of choice. You live on the barrier island, you go to your barrier, barrier island school. Um, our current plan origins really rests in the district's efforts to gain unitary status, which is to be removed from the federal court order, which went into place with the Blaylock case in 1965. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a huge deal because when we're out in the community and we're talking about the plan, um, you know, you can't escape the past, right? And so we wanna use history as our guide to make sure that we're not repeating any of the issues of the past, whether it's segregation by class or race or, or student achievement level. Uh, so using that as a guide has been really important and having uh, Jared Eady and myself uh, on the, you know, on the technical working group, that's been, you know, that's been helpful, I think, for our consultant group, Davis Demographics, and then also in operations uh, for them to realize about, you know, some of the historical considerations. Um, you know, how students choose schools now is students rank schools and then they're given preferences. So it is a form of controlled choice. And uh, I wanna just emphasize that because the preferences are a controlling mechanism in the lottery. And that is based on sibling and proximity. Um, now we do have a number of issues with our current plan. Uh, and most notably, I think is some of the transportation inefficiency. And then more related to my studies is some of the, um, I call it demographic isolation, but you could call it just uh, concentrations of students uh, from one particular uh, classification, whether you know it's race, class, uh, socioeconomic uh, achievement level, the correlated layers there. Uh, so that's a little bit on the history. You know, the future and, and where we're trying to go with this new student assignment plan. And I wanted to break this down as simple as you know as simple as possible. We want to create new zones that are smaller. That, that can address some of the uneven distribution of students on a micro level, uh, a little bit smaller student pool, maintain choice. Uh, so students will still, or uh, parents and families will still have choice in these new elementary zones uh, on average about three to four um, and can, uh, can address the, the transportation efficiency issues, bus ride time and bus wait times. You know, one of the things that I was really key on in talking to the community about was the associated savings in terms of cost and how that could be redirected uh, into our classrooms and buildings. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's really what, how I want, I want, I want a cost benefit analysis on this. I want to see how many millions we're saving that can be pumped right into the classroom. Uh, because, you know, as a teacher, a former teacher for 12 years, I always recognized that the, you know, the school sites, they, they could use, um, they could never be too overfunded. Um, from my perspective. So I really thought about that. But then when I've been presenting to the community, somebody, uh, somebody brought up last week, they were like, what about the associated hour savings on the bus and what that could be translated to in terms of student achievement? And I thought, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I like the cost savings. I like the hour savings. Um, you know, I do think one of the major goals is building uh, community choice uh, schools or areas uh, and this is going to have a, a significant impact on hundreds of kids in each of our new zones. Um, and so that's important to note just in terms of the, the challenges um, that we face as we, as we move through this process. Now, out of all the four draft plans that we, we currently have, um, each new draft has about 19 total or 16 total new zones with the three barrier island subzones. Uh, so we're really adding seven uh, new choice zones, getting smaller, getting more strategic. Um, and that's kind of our goals for the, you know, for the, for the proximity plan. Uh, this is our current, you guys are probably familiar with this map and have stared at it, stared at it for hours, if not years, trying to figure out how we could do it more efficiently. Uh, how we could draw lines in a, in a different manner. Um, and anytime you draw boundaries, uh, you, you're drawing attention to, uh, to difference and divide uh, amongst neighborhoods and streets and communities. And that's something uh, I think that we've been really, you know, that we've been really cognizant on, uh, of as a team um, and really receptive. So we, we've re received and processed about 30 public input forms, some of which 
you know, drew our attention to areas that we were unaware was a major issue. Uh, and that's been that's been really important. And that's kind of the phase we're in right now is just collecting public feedback on the draft plans. But this is our current and then this is what our future uh, has the potential to look like. Um, and this is draft plan four, but there are four draft plans up, which we'll kind of go over. Uh, and you can see that instead of the east, uh, south and west, we do have now just a an alphabet soup of new zones. Um, and hopefully, you know, with these letters become associated new identities and uh, communities of choice and uh, stronger communities of choice. Uh, you know, it, it, that's what I would really like to see. The how is really important, and this is something I think that um, you know we we took a lot of we took a lot of critique uh, about the how because the how is not actually that engaging, and that's really the you know the the technology side of it. You know, how can we make this plan strategic? How can we make it equitable? How can we make sure that the boundaries and the new student pools are where we want to be moving forward as, a, forward as a district for the next 10 years? How is this best practices, national best practices in terms of student boundaries and student policies? And that really comes along with our consultant group, Davis Demographics. Uh, they, are, they're, they use uh, the latest GIS software, which is, you know, geographic information system. They're able to layer every single student that we have, where they live, what their, uh, all of the different data pieces that we have on them uh, so that we can, we can really take a look at each, each new attendance zone and we can say, okay, where are they in terms of percentage of FSA score? Where are they in terms of socioeconomic level? Is this too isolated? Is this too concentrated? And I think that that data piece was, uh, was really important, um, you know, moving forward in the project. So, you know, in, in my spare time, I would propose all these alternative student assignment plans, but I didn't have the GIS uh, software or skill set. And now that we have that, it's a, you know, it's it's a game changer. We have people, um, we have people that are that are at the district that have very unique skill sets. But you combine that with the technology, like Davis has brought with their, you know, with their software. Um, you know, it's real game changing type of stuff. This way, we don't have to change these new zones every single school year like they did in the '90s. Uh, this way, we have a little bit better grip on our predictions uh, for capacity um, and for generation rates, so where these students are going. Um, so Davis Demographics, they layer student data, residential data, community data, uh, really on the policy and program side. Uh, that's kind of where the district is, you know, is really, you know, keeping up there into the bargain, you know, working on grandfather policies, working on, uh, you know, lottery mechanisms to deal with uh, student distribution. You know, and I call it a year of engagement uh, for this new plan, um, but it feels like every day is is kind of like a, a crucial make or break for the proximity plan. Uh, where we are now is just, uh, we have four drafts, we're collecting public feedback, we're answering questions, we have a website, we have, you know, frequently asked questions. In March, based on the public feedback, we're gonna be uh, going back out to the public with some final maps, so probably one or two maps. Um, and that's, uh, you know, moving on from there, uh, the goal is to present um, the final boundaries uh, to the board uh, in July of 2021. I just wanted to draw your attention to some of the transportation issues. Um, and I say, I say issues in that, you know, it's our job as district stakeholders to ensure that every single school uh, is overselected and oversubscribed. So I just I just want to draw your attention. Um, all of these little teal or or I guess what you call aqua marine. It's actually uh, my son and I's favorite color. Um, are students that live uh, in Lee County. Now all of these little aqua marine students uh, they go to Allen Park, and you can see a large number of those students are traveling well past uh, their closest neighborhood school. Uh, even so far as going east of tree line. Now that could be an employee waiver or a special circumstance, uh, but you can see a large number of the North McGregor corridor uh, moving past what is traditionally thought as as a neighborhood school in Tanglewood uh, Elementary. Um, you know, and these are just students that attend Allen Park. If I were to pull back the map even further, uh, you can see that there's Allen Park kids all across the south zone. Uh, this is the Heights map. Now, Heights has a, has a really strong reach. And, you know, Heights, um, if you're familiar with the Heights history and its programming and its pull, which I know a lot of people on the, on the call are, uh, you know, Heights is able to draw, uh, you know, from a very far distance. So Heights isn't even shown on the map here. But all of these little blue dots go to Heights and have uh, district um, transportation afforded to them uh, if they so choose. Um, and I think that, you know, this is, this is kind of one of the areas that we need to correct 
as a district. You know, the ch choice and competition are great, but not when it comes at a cost at underselected schools uh, that are closer uh, to, you know, to your home. Um, you know, it, it, talking with the community and, and getting out there and, you know, it just breaks my heart whenever I hear a parent say, well, you know, the five schools that are closest to me are not nice or not or are not good. Uh, and, and that's something that it's something that I don't think anybody from the district side on this call uh, or school board school board member Fisher would would ever, you know, would ever listen to uh, and not just be in pain. Uh, because as stakeholders, it's our job to ensure a certain high level of consistent professional expectations. Um, and I know that this system has gotten a little, little off track when you have uh, when you have dots like this across the map, and uh, when you have comments from you know from the community, uh, such as the one I just referenced. Maybe another example here, and this is maybe a bit repetitive for the mapping. I'm sure everybody's like, "Yeah, we get it. We're busing a lot of kids past a lot of closer schools." Uh, I did it too, but I just got a little creative with the snippet here. So um, this is all, these are all students that go to uh, James Stevens. Um, and you can see it's really, you know, James Stevens does draw pretty close to James Stevens. But then if you go out on 82, out into, Le out into Lehigh, uh, you can see that they're pulling a large number of students from the, what, what is now the East Zone. Project timeline, this is by far the most boring slide in this entire presentation. All you need to know is that March, we're coming back out after getting public feedback on each one of the drafts um, with a final map or two. Uh, and then in July 2021, we are proposing uh, the, the new student assignment plan, uh, boundaries, policies uh, to the school board. Um, and so, yeah, if you're I guess if you're spiritual, please, you know, please keep that process in your your thoughts or your prayers or whatever incense might assist with that process. Uh, now, currently what we have up uh, is we have our own website, uh, leeschools.net slash proximity plan. Um, we are taking uh, questions, comments, and meeting requests at the email proximity plan at leeschools.net. Uh, we've received uh, close to 100 emails, all have been responded to. Uh, primary concern is about grandfathering. Um, and we also uh, I wanted to show you guys all so some of the cool stuff that we have on the, the website, if that's okay. So if we go to uh, leaseschools.net slash proximity plan, it has our little kids all excited to go to their new choices in their new zones. And if you scroll down, it'll say interactive map of elementary school proximity plan. And you can see here, it's got the public input form. Uh, that's the official one where you can make comments on each one of the drafts. But when you click on the interactive map, it'll take you to Davis's um, mapping software. And, uh, you know, it'll come up with a little disclaimer uh, saying that these are still drafts. And you just click OK. And then the, the default draft is, um, is plan four. And I was talking uh, with Dr. Quisenberry and, and uh, Ms. Alavedo about it uh, because this is the one that has taken the most stakeholder input. Um, and it actually, it vastly improves on some of the issues that we had in plans one, two, and three. It doesn't mean that this is the plan that will eventually go forward. Uh, and in fact, we've received a lot of recent feedback that is highly critical of, uh, of plan four. Uh, which has thrown uh, myself and in the team uh, back to the drawing board. So if you click on these little layer lists right here, you can uh, you can you can check out the density. You can check out a whole bunch of stuff. But really, right here, you got your your proposed proximity zones one, two, three, and four. So if you take off four, you could do one and one, you know, to two. Uh, really, the biggest changes are right here in the central Fort Myers area, or what we would call. Uh, you know, the more historic, densely populated area of, of Central Fort Myers, and then down here um, in uh, San Carlos, Estero, and Benita. Uh, so, you know, check those out. You know, we also, based on public feedback, we put up a whole bunch of student data. So if you look at the student data for plans uh, one, two, and three, and four, you can see what the, what the percentages are um, in terms of race and ethnicity and FSA score and ELL. Um, you can see those percentage, those breakdowns of each one of the new zones. Now, there are some of the new, new zone numbers where, you know, it's a little more concentrated than you would like. You, I mean, it is difficult because you're dealing with, um, you know, with, with a lot of legacy of residential uh, segregation by class and race uh, in our area. Uh, but 
overall, I would say the new zones. So if we have 16 new zones, I would say 14 out of the 16 are good to go as long as you distribute the pool evenly. Um, and that's really, that's really been one of our major issues uh, the past 15 years is that we've really become uneven in our distribution of, uh, uneven in our distribution of students. Sorry, that was not for a uh, dramatic pause. Uh, somebody just knocked on the window. Some neighbor that wanted to get in on the student assignment plan. Well, it's not happening. I got curriculum right now. So, um, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have received a lot of feedback and we have responded to a lot of emails. Uh, we are gonna give out uh, Dr. Spiro this little, we want your feedback in Spanish, English, and Haitian Creole to all elementary school principals. We've started our run of school site engagement uh, where, you know, if you ever wanna just have a, a great Tuesday night, uh, schedule a, a PTA meeting uh, with a bunch of parents that live in a, in a new zone and won't have that school as their choice. Um, it makes for a really fun evening, but you know we are working on the grandfather policy, and hopefully we should have something final, um, you know, in the next few weeks, or at least an endorsement uh, of where the direction wants to go, uh, or where the district wants to go. And also, we have some lottery companions. Um, we have some lottery companions uh, that are in the works as well. Uh, so that really completes uh, my presentation. I'm sorry if I said uh, too much, and you know, I'm sorry if I, I rambled or went off on too many tangents. It is a passion that I'm extremely it is a project that I'm extremely passionate about, and I do think if done right, and we have the skill set to do it at the district, uh, this could be a, a new student assignment plan that is vastly improved uh, from the current one. Uh, this really does have a, an opportunity uh, to do what's right by our students uh, and to create and fix. Well, actually, a lot of the stuff is in the current plan. Uh, we, just have, we just have gotten away from it a little bit, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about its potential for our kids across the board. Um, I'm excited to get a little bit closer to home with our choices. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just happy to have a seat at the table. So thank you guys so much for your time. And I'm excited with Dr. Spiro to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, thanks Mr. Malloy. And so I know you normally do a longer presentation that goes more in depth into each of the four proposed plans right now. And so when you were asking them to go to that webpage at leaseschools.net backslash proximity plan, that's where they can find those four plans. You talked about the overlay so they can see each of those four plans. Am I correct on that? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, we, normally, we, you know, we, we mess around with the map and we put in addresses and things like that. But I just thought for, for time's sake uh, that if you had that, um, you know, knowledge with the website, you could go in and check it out and, and do it on a little bit more personal level um, besides, you know, just looking at where the district's address is and what those choices would be. Great. Yeah, we do have a, a big question I knew was going to come up and I think you probably anticipated as well. And it's really around the grandfathering and it's just asking, could you elaborate a little bit on the grandfather policy? Yeah, so, um, you know, that's a, that's the big personal aspect, um, you know, of the plan. Uh, it is, you know, despite only being a few paragraphs or one paragraph in length, um, early on, it could, I think it, it could, it could gain either a lot of support or opposition uh, for the new student assignment plan. You know, parents uh, and families have, have, have worked really hard uh, in some cases to get their preferred choice or preferred school. Um, so a grandfather policy is designed to allow parents um, in, you know, in, 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 there are varying degrees, but to allow uh, current enrollment or kids that are currently enrolled in a school outside of their new zone uh, to stay there. Uh, now where the district is, you know, where we're, where we're taking a look at a few things is, uh, what does that look like in terms of the capacity of the new zones? Um, and we did run some numbers, so I'll give you an example. There was uh, a large school uh, in zone um, in zone O in plan four, and I wanted to know how many of that school lived outside of the new zone. So how many students would potentially uh, either have to move schools or have, depending on where we go, an option to stay at their school through a, a grandfathering policy. And it worked out to, to be about 15 uh, percent, but the numbers that we're seeing range from 15 percent to 25 percent uh, that live outside of the current school uh, zone. Uh, so the grandfather policy would um, allow students to stay at their current school. Uh, the district may not provide transportation. We're still analyzing the options on that. Um, now, the, the, big, the, the big third component is the sibling component. 
uh, is let's say you're a fourth grader outside of a zone, you're providing your own transportation. What happens when you have a an upcoming kindergartner uh, that wants to go to the same school? Um, and looking at best, well, I don't know if you call it best practices, but looking at a whole bunch of districts uh, that changed um, boundaries and had to re and had to had to have a grandfather policy. I've seen examples of no grandfathering at all, uh, and that really I didn't see that in a choice district. Uh, I've seen rising fourth and fifth graders, uh, but in the examples that I've seen, no sibling was able to maintain once that older sibling uh, finished the highest level at the school. So right now we're looking at allowing students, uh, we're, we're analyzing, can we allow students based on capacity to stay at the school, okay? We're not going to provide transportation because we would just be perpetuating the inefficiencies of, uh, of the old system. And then what about the sibling? Will the sibling have to choose, the, uh, the incoming sibling have to choose from the new schools or will they be given a sibling preference to attend out of zone with their older sibling and for how long? So, you know, sorry for, yeah, there's really three components. Um, do you get to stay and who gets to stay? Uh, transportation, and it does not appear that, the, that we're gonna be moving in that direction just based on the, the overall goals of the plan and then sibling. So that's the, 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 that's the grandfather kind of options uh, of where we're at now. I do not see the plan, I see the plan encountering a lot of problems if grandfathering is not an option. Uh, for the kids that are currently enrolled. And I think that, uh, that those on the call, uh, you know, that have, that have studied boundaries and, and, and stuff like that, I think you, you would agree that a grandfathering option has to be provided. Uh, we have to do what's, we, we have to come to the table on that and do what's best for both the district and, and the parents on that one. Uh, but eventually we would like to see these new zones and new choices uh, work themselves out over the next, you know, uh, three to four years to where we really get a good idea of what we're dealing with here uh, in these new zones. Thanks, Adam. And I know that's a, a huge challenge for you and your team, or, you know, how to address the issue of grandfathering, because it, it really is very personal for individuals. Uh, another question that comes up is about secondary, middle school and high school. Do you see this progressing um, to middle school and high school after the implementation of elementary? You know, that's a great question. You know, right now it's just for elementary. One thing that I, I just, I want, and I know you guys, are, you know, being with curriculum, you guys are, are well aware is that our middle schools and our high schools have, uh, have magnetized, have heavily magnetized and not in a traditional magnet sense, but just in terms of a programming sense. Um, and that's one thing that you would have to consider is the equitable provision of programming uh, for kids. So if you're going to create, like, let's say you take uh, proximity from elementary to middle, but then in those new zones, you don't have the option to go to an art school or you don't have the option uh, to go to, um, you know, maybe a, um, a pre-A school or a pre-IB school or something along those lines. Uh, then you run into some equity issues there. Uh, so that's something, you know, we do have on the contract with Davis Demographics if warranted middle and high school. Uh, but remember that we do have a lot fewer middle and high schools. Um, and that they are broken up currently into a regional system. So I'm not sure how much more regional you could get uh, with your middle with your middle and, and high schools. You could get to maybe an option, and this has not been discussed, but just on a personal side, you could get to an option where, you know, maybe you are, um, you know, you, you're assigned a geographic middle school, but then you have the choice to attend or apply to one of the, the program middle schools. But that's, you know, that's, that, that has not been even discussed. But yeah, right now it's just elementary school. It starts 22-23, so uh, the fall of, uh, of 22. I saw that in the comment. Yeah, it's just the fall of 22. And, um, you know, incoming kindergartners, they would have the, they would have the new choices, new zones. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, you know, in middle school, high school, and especially being a high school teacher, you know, we were so hyper competitive. Um, I remember, yeah, I, I remember being so competitive with Cape High and, and how that works out and the choice and the competition there. And, you know, sometimes maybe it got the best of us in terms of the bigger, the bigger picture, but yeah, I, I middle school and high school is a different, a different ball game. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, what about employee waivers? Have there been any conversation about removing that or keeping that as part of the plan? No, I, I, employee waivers for me are so important because we want to do everything we can to support our support our teachers. Uh, I, 
I think last time I, I asked student enrollment, I think they honored every employee waiver that they could last year to the best of their ability. So I don't see employee waivers. Uh, in fact, you know, we have like seven or eight waivers, but I see employee waivers. If we ever do modify or change, I see employee waivers as the one to keep. Uh, you want to honor and you want to respect it. You want to support your teachers as best you can. Thanks, Adam. But before I open this up for everybody else, because those were the, the main questions in the chat box, I'm going to give a a selfish plug because we have Dr. Wilkerson here and Dr. Wilkerson uh, has very close ties with FGCU. And so if we're looking for another segment of our population to give feedback on the proximity plan, um, we can put you in contact with Dr. Wilkerson and, uh, and be able to have that um, be part of the community input too, Adam. Okay, so um, if anybody wants to unmute their microphone, I, we answered all the questions during the chat. So if there's any questions you have for Mr. Malloy, Candace, could you put that address up there again? The, I want to make sure everybody has access to that email address because if you don't give the questions tonight that you want, was Adam you were driving? Um, okay, thank you. So if you could put that back up there, I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to write that address down. Um, so that you could give the feedback because no, none of this is a done deal. This is they literally are on the road. They're meeting with every board advisory, getting uh, input. They've had community forums to get input as well. And Adam just put in the chat box. He just typed in there what that address was. So I'm going to ask you to please make sure that you write that down and make sure you give him feedback. But at this time, um, you know, we have a very small intimate group. I think we could just unmute our mics if you have any questions. Um, Mr. Malloy is the man, and if he can't answer for you, he definitely will um, add it to the feedback and take it back to his team. So, Brian, you're up. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Um, no, I, you, you answered the question. Um, I certainly would be, a, from a personal level, a fan of uh, grandfathering to some degree. Uh, but uh, siblings would get preference if, they're, if the school happens to be in the same zone, correct? Going yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. The sibling, the sibling preference is key uh, within the within the zone. I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to provide transportation, but I, I one car line, car lines, you know, rough enough, you know. Uh, but, uh, that's just a personal opinion, you know. But uh, no further questions. I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Anything else? So I have a question for Adam. Um, you made a you made a comment that you have had comments from people saying, "Oh, the five closest schools to me are not good." What's the plan to address that? Because now that we don't have the ability to say to someone, "Well, you know, go visit those schools and then come back and we'll talk," because a lot of times when I've done that in the past, they've come back and said, "Wow, I had no idea," and so then they realize that there's a lot more. Um, equitable opportunity in our schools than they had thought before and they listened to rumors. So now that we have the pandemic and we're limited on that, what's the plan other than, you know, really beefing up the websites? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, and part of my critique of the, of the current system is that sometimes I view it uh, as an open market you know, for, uh, for schools. And in, in a lot of ways, it can drive programming and competition. Uh, but, you know, in a market, you have uh, over-selected products and you have under-selected products. And I don't think as, a, as someone that, you know, that, that cares a lot about education in, in the district, that that's, that's not okay with me. Um, I, I would like to feel very confident in all of our products. And I know that what you mentioned is the perception. You know, you talk to parents about perception uh, and that is that is so challenging. And I've had to respond in, a, in, in very creative ways to, to parents when they describe schools as as being ones that they would not want to select. Um, and the reasoning is um, it's hard. It, a lot of it is, is layered. Uh, a lot of it is veiled. A lot of it is, you know, uh, what I would see as, as a as a direct um, uh, condemnation of some of our, our, our more isolated schools, uh, you know, schools that have become under-selected, under-selected, transient, 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 under-selected, a uh, waiting list. You know, when you go to a, when you go to an elementary school and 40 kids in kindergarten are on a waiting list or first grade, and, you know, I, I've talked to principals and that, that's unacceptable to me. So I think Ms. Fisher, the big dream for me is that we're able to better uh, evenly distribute student pools in these new zones. 
um, so that we can deal directly with some of the, the under selection problems. Now we have, of course, the regular district routes of uh, marketing and uh, online marketing and virtual open houses. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the perception is, you know, is small social and, and peer groups. Uh, and that's, you know, that's difficult to infiltrate for sure. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of the elementary schools that, that parents have described as not being nice and they couldn't be more wrong. Uh, if you ever want to be inspired, you go to an elementary school and you just see them, you just see them rocking, uh, you know, every aspect of the classroom. Um, I put our elementary schools up against, you know, against anybody uh, for sure. But no, I think the, the idea for me is that we can address over time the uneven nature of student distribution. And that's going to that's gonna take a lot of legwork on, uh, on the policy side. It's going to take a lot of legwork on the programming side. Uh, and I know that we have support by the leaders that are on this call for doing it. And they, they do it on a daily basis. They, they're trying to ensure that these schools are, you know, are, are up to standard and, you know, ready for, for anybody that comes into the classroom. Um, but, you know, when I look at the demographics over the past 20 years and I see schools uh, that have changed so much and there's, there's so many factors that go into how do you go from uh, having a 300 or 250 student waiting list uh, to being under capacity, under selected in one of the most isolated schools in the district as it comes to race, ethnicity, socioeconomic and FSA score. Uh, that to me is something that, you know, that we need to, you know, we need to be continually working on uh, to try to address that. But to answer your first question, I would like to deal with how we distribute students in each one of the student pools. It's already controlled. We might as well get to some of our plan goals uh, and try to ensure that a good choice uh, that can balance out of school uh, will be honored. So that's, you know, some of the conversations, early conversations that we're having. Uh, but, you know, Dr. Spiro, uh, was not only a great principal that I worked for, uh, but he understands the importance of having a decent spread of, uh, of FSA scores or, or student achievement scores in a school. Uh, if you have a high concentration of just one or twos, which are the two lowest scores, uh, you're, going to, you're going to struggle. Um, and I think there's a significant amount of data to back that up. It might be the twos or threes where there's some, some good breakout, but yeah, if, if we can have a little bit better distribution, if we can control and honor that in the lottery, um, and if we can, you know, continue to do what we do in terms of leadership and teachers and staffing and resources, uh, which I think we do a fantastic job of, uh, but it's, ha it's having those difficult conversations, um, you know, with, uh, with peer groups across the community. And that's one of the great parts of, of my new job is that I get, to, I get to represent the district on a macro level, which I always did uh, before, but I get to represent it in these, in these informal peer groups and step in and say, that's actually not correct. Uh, you couldn't be more wrong. Uh, that school is, is, is an amazing school uh, with amazing teachers and should be honored and talked about as such. Uh, so that's, uh, that was my rant on that. Sorry about that, Ms. Fisher. No, oh, good. That's great. I appreciate that answer. Yep. Great analysis, uh, Adam. Thank you so much. Anybody else? April, are you wearing a Bucks shirt? Are you, April, are you wearing a Bucks jersey? All that. Well done. Hi, Marissa. Specifically for Candace. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> we were friends, April. We were friends. <laughs> Go ahead, Marissa. Um, I was just going to say thank you for uh, keeping the waiver. <laughs> um, no, I literally, I, I, I did all of this already for my first kiddo. And then I'm like, all right, new proximity stuff. I only live five minutes from Veterans Park and I'm pretty sure this is it. So we're gonna stay forever and ever and ever. And so <laughs> I'm like, my next one goes in 2024. So I'm like, oh, I really want them to go to Veterans together. They're only two years apart. So <laughs> I'm like, please go. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's gonna help. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, Marissa. And one of the things I've been encouraging parents to do uh, is to just check out the new zone so that they can make sure that, you know, hey, I, you know, I might live there already. Uh, I might live in that zone and I might have no problem keeping that, you know, keeping that, that choice. But we are seeing, like I mentioned, uh, there is going to be a percent of, there's going to be a change in schools, uh, it's school demographics, small, but, uh, you know, significant or recognizable, I guess. Sorry. Anybody else? No, 
No. Okay, so what we're going to say, Adam, you definitely want to encourage everybody to go to, uh, it's in the chat box, the proximity plan, leaveschools.net. Make sure you give the feedback. Uh, we're anticipating them. You're going to bring these uh, maps back out. You said in summertime around March and make a final presentation to the board in July. So if people want to stay attuned to the changes, is that where all the communication is going to be on that one web page right there? Yeah, that web page is kind of like your one-stop shop uh, for everything on there. And if there's any major uh, changes or communication about public events, we'll communicate that through all the district uh, communication channels and school site channels that we have. And I know you just spent, um, just finished off a couple big community events where you guys said David's demographics come in. Are you anticipating anything in the future uh, so this group can mark their calendars for a little more in-depth presentation? Yeah, uh, so there is a, a more in-depth presentation of each one of the plans on the website. They did a kind of like a virtual recording. Uh, Courtney Gordon, who's a great GIS analyst in Davis Demographics, they did the PowerPoint. Um, we're also going to be doing a Facebook Live virtual option uh, in mid-February and just kind of stay tuned about when that is. We're trying to get the, the exact planning and how we're going to how we're going to include uh, Davis demographics and things like that in the in the Facebook Live. So that'll be similar to how we ran some of our reopening schools uh, and health panel Facebook Lives, where we collect questions, feedback, and then we respond live uh, during the event. Adam, thank you so much for being here tonight. I know you you're a busy man. Every night you're on the road talking with community groups. So uh, thank you very much for being here with us this evening. Thank you guys so much for all the work that you do. Um, you know, and I try to make the student assignment plan just as important as curriculum, but it's not. Um, you know, curriculum is 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 where it's at, and everything that you guys do to to add to our classrooms and add to our teachers and and really just get the depth uh, in there. You know, that the teachers can use. I really appreciate it as a former teacher, uh, as that people that really you know commit and um, you know are, are involved in the input uh, that goes into our curriculum, uh, and also dealing with some. Um, maybe not so happy community members about the curriculum. I know that it's got to be a challenge to balance uh, what you do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, thank you guys so much for your time and all the involvement that you, that you have with the district. Adam, okay, Marissa, back to you. All right. Uh, so thank you again. And it looks like we're going to move on to our ALA textbook adoption update and recommendations, which is presented and discussed um, by Candace and was it also Lori it went away okay I'm just making sure I'm like I read it really fast and then it disappeared <laughs> yep it's Lori Lori's actually going to be leading us in this charge and I'm going to be driving good evening everyone so um, we've been keeping you apprised of the fact that we um or went through textbook adoption this year for English language arts and for um, intensive reading. Um, so with the governor's order of um, changing our standards in the next couple of years, um, it was necessary that we also change our instructional materials and it was time for the cycle uh, for English language arts. So the new best standards um, will be in full implementation for kindergarten through second grade next year and then the following year for uh, the remaining grades uh, three through 12. So the courses that we reviewed during textbook adoption, we looked at materials for kindergarten through fifth grade for English language arts, kindergarten through fifth grade for like a core reading program. We looked at um, six through grade six through eight language arts curriculum. We also looked at intensive reading for um, our middle grades. We also looked at materials for our high school English courses, both on level and honors, and then um, intensive reading for high school. So those were all of the curriculum um, from the short bid list that the state approved for the vendors that our textbook adoption committee um, reviewed and weighed in on to make a decision. And Marissa and April from Curriculum Advisory, they served um, on uh, the committees, on the various committees, one at the, um, re one for reading and one for English language arts. So we did have some representation. Thank you very much from Curriculum Advisory. 
So um, we had um, 21 K, uh, kindergarten through second grade teachers, 24 grade three through five teachers, and one administrator to serve on the elementary school. And they served for both the reading adoption and the English language arts adoption. In middle school, we had 19 teachers and one student. Um, and for the middle school reading committee, we had 19 teachers. For high school English language arts, we had 12 teachers um, serve on the committee and 15 teachers for intensive reading. So um, we had representation, all schools were invited, um, but not all schools finished the process. So um, they had to attend every training and every meeting. Um, so these were the teachers who and students who finished out. Um, the categories that they used to evaluate the materials was they obviously they looked at the content, they looked at the instructional design and what supports were there for teachers and students for the instructional design. They looked at how the materials were organized, um, how the presentation uh, for, you know, what the digital components are uh, versus the hardback text. They looked at equity. Um, does is there an accessibility? So do we have supports in place for our English language learners, for students with exceptionalities? Um, we also looked at what types of assessment opportunities there were and what types of feedback opportunities there were. So those were the five main contents and within those, each of those had specific categories. And so they came to um, consensus and so for elementary, uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, they chose McGraw-Hill. Um, Wonders is the name of the curriculum. For secondary, um, for grade six through 12, we also um, picked McGraw-Hill for English language arts. And then for secondary reading, for intensive reading, grade six through 12, they chose Houghton Mifflin, which is the Read 180 and System 44 curriculum. And so, um, so from here, we will be briefing the board. Um, we will work with finance. This will be a, an expensive adoption um, for a couple of reasons because, um, because Florida is now on their own and it's not a national standards curriculum had to be written specifically for Florida. So that increased the price a little bit. And because English language arts is a huge adoption because it touches every kid in our district. Um, so we'll be looking at what finance to see like what packages we can afford and then we'll work with our publishers for pricing options. And then of course, once we get that, we will um, go to the board for approval um, for the adoption. And then we'll look at our purchasing and getting the, our teachers trained in materials in the classrooms. And our usual goal is to get teachers trained um, at the end of the school year before the next school year and summer, and then get the curriculum in the schools that summer as well and give teachers access. So at this time, we um, wanna open it up for any conversation or questions because um, we would like for you to, um, to be able, and, and I would like for April and Marissa also to be able to talk about their experience because we always mm -hmm. like for curriculum advisory to weigh in and let Ms. Fisher, our board member know um, if they were satisfied with the process, if curriculum advisory was satisfied with the process. Marissa and April. Okay. Um, so I was on for ELA um, and I represented my school, Veterans Park. And uh, it, it, was, it was interesting because uh, there was seven uh, presenters. So it, it took all day to kind of like watch each presentation. Cause I think each presentation got like 30, 40 minutes um, to show all of their stuff to us. Um, and then we ha I, I had my own just running tab of notes going on my computer and um, just kind of made note of one of the things that I took into deep consideration, and I know that, you know, one of the, it's one of the things that might not be forever, I get that, but is I have hybrid all day long. Um, so I have sixth, seventh and eighth grade, and I have online and I have face-to-face -face kiddos all day. And so when I was watching presentations, I was looking at, can this be done on two platforms at the same time? 
Um, so it's just one of those things. And I understand that this might not be a situation um, that we might have forever and ever, but it's a situation that's very real right now. So it was in the front of my mind when I was watching the presentations and getting and, and, and just seeing them basically. Um, I wanted to see, you know, can this be done in two different ways? You know, uh, how accessible is it? If you wanted to have stuff for in-person, can it translate over to online? And, you know, just, it's just one of those things that was, I thought about a lot because I live it <laughs> every day. Um, so that's why. Thank you, Marissa. April, your experience? So, um, and Dr. Scott, I saw your question in there, but um, very thorough and thoughtful in what the training that we had for those of you that have not had the opportunity to serve on a textbook adoption, if you have the time, I definitely think it's something that everyone should experience once in their life. Um, but no, serious, in all seriousness, I agree with Marissa as well. Uh, I teach one sixth grade class and um, it's a hybrid class being able to use that curriculum fluidly and for all teachers across the district for all of our students, it's really important. But the process that we had to go through, um, we spent a lot of time uh, and there was a lot going back and forth between teachers to make sure we made the best choice and the best recommendations. So uh, I know Dr. Wilkerson's been a part of this as well before, so she can speak to the thoroughness um, and the accountability that's held to the standard. So I just appreciate it. And I think we did make the best choice, at least at the middle school. I know that um, the publishers really did a good job with the curriculum that we had. Dr. Wilkerson, thank you, April. Thank you. I'm sure you did a, a wonderful, wonderful job. The um, only thing that I, I, I saw that I wanted to ask about is how you looked at these materials in terms of standards alignment. I saw content, but I didn't know if that's where you embedded the standards alignment or how deeply did you delve into the alignment between these materials and the new standards since that's the driving force for having to get new materials and why are we doing this to ourselves and that's another question <laughs> we um we developed a standards training um i sit on uh, a lot of state committees and um so had a lot of firsthand knowledge of the standards and the new standards and then um, our teams use the k-12 through progression of how the standard change um, at each grade level um, and so I have to really commend our teachers and even our students who sat on there. They really studied those standards because we warned them that some publishers in a rush to try to meet this deadline may just change numbers uh, and it really won't address the new standards. And so they really, um, from I, we all sat in, we weren't voting members, but we were able to hear all of the conversations and help facilitate. And they really did their due diligence and really studied those standards and really asked the tough questions to the publishers. Um, and one of the questions being is that as they gain more information about the standards and see a need to change, will they be changing the digital materials? And so um, asking for those assurances as well. So did you do any kind of like spot checking, you know, say here's a set of standards, where is it in this? curriculum to make sure that it's there. And when they say they're doing standard X, you can actually see standard X in the materials that they were presenting, a, a, like a systematic process of aligning the materials with the new standards to make sure that there aren't any gaps or misalignments. Um, part of the training was showing them where uh, the rigor of the standard has increased or a standard may have changed grade levels. And so um, they did do a lot of spot checking to make sure that uh, the changes that we saw when we did a cross um, reference between our current standards and the standards that we're about to adopt, they did a lot of spot checking to make sure that um, it was aligning appropriately. So April or Marissa, do you wanna to add to that? 
So for, um, for one of the things that I know that I looked at is making sure that whatever the, when the presenters were presenting, um, that they were aligned already with best so that the teachers don't have to do it themselves when we're converting laughs to best. And so 90% of them were already aligned um, to best, which is extremely helpful because even just if, if you know, the way things are, are right now, like with teaching, you know, two different platforms and you have kids here and you have kids there, the last thing that a teacher needs is to now convert to standard <laughs> to what, you know, what it, what we currently are using and not what we're using from the past. And so it just would be nice if the new, if the new curriculum is kind of an all in one package. Um, and most of the presenters, what they were showing us, it was already aligned to best, which is what we were, were shooting for. So when you give materials to the teachers after you have um, um, implemented these new materials, will the teachers have something that says, okay, chapter one is standard X, um, or this activity aligns with this yeah. standard. So yeah, they'll know exactly where they are in the standard yeah, at all times. Yeah, it usually shows you in the beginning of like a unit. So okay. whatever you're working on, it'll show you what this, it'll be like the top four standards like for that unit and then it and then it has what you're reading and then supplemental and it has all of that like usually right in the in the beginning of of like a unit it'll it'll say that a lot of the presenters had stuff like that just sort of love like that front loading piece okay and you verified when you were doing your review that their front loading was accurate because the thing that worries me is that i see in a lot of cases the author says it's standard X and you look at it and you say, really? Looks like Y to me. And so that, you know, it's, it's easy to say, this is your alignment, but people need to check and say that the alignment is real and not imagined. That's where I think we, we lose so much ground. We think we're teaching one thing and we're not. Dr. Wilkerson, we also provide instructional guides for, um for all of our, our grade levels, all of our teachers. And so that's that's what they follow for the standards. So the textbooks are a resource and they follow our instructional guides to ensure that they you know, are teaching to the rigor of the standard and that we're ensuring exactly what you just said, that it is actually meeting um, the standard that we're trying to teach. Cool, and that's where I think it, it needs to be. And then if you see that there's a misalignment in the textbook, um, or whatever materials they're learning to, you kind of point that out so that people don't hope they're doing something that they're not. Yeah, and our, um, we, we, I would say the past four or five years, our scope and sequence and our curriculum map, they, it drives what the teachers teach and our textbooks are just a resource. And so the instructional guides are really um, that we're writing and we write them not only aligned to the K through 12 progression of the standard, but also the achievement level descriptor of the standard so that teachers have entry points. Um, so if, a, if they're teaching students who are below grade level, then their entry level point for that standard might be lower to get to mastery, you know, to be proficient, whereas a proficient student or above proficiency, their, um, their entry point would be much further in the instructional guide. So um, that's what we, we, we will continue to to do with um, with the new standards is start building those out and then using that textbook as and other supplemental things as a resource. Um, and, and so they're not going page by page in that textbook like we used to. Cool, thank you. Oh, were you gonna say something? I'm sorry, I think I cut you off. I was just gonna say that Dr. Wilkerson, we tore the programs apart and we looked at it very carefully um, because we know the importance of meeting those standards, especially with the transition periods. So we compared them side by side. In addition to the times that we were doing with our groups, some of our schools, I can only speak for our school, but we met and looked at the two programs or the different programs, ELA and reading at the middle school level and put them side by side. 
So that because we have to be able to come back to our schools and we have to be able to work with our new teachers with these supplemental sources in teaching these new standards. So we wanted to make sure that it was very clear and that it met those best standards that we have coming forward. Terrific. Thank you. That's that's great. And then we have job. a couple of, um, so Pam's question is um, working with MTSS at Lehigh Acres Middle, that reading is a real concern and how can we make it a core subject? So that is a commitment that Dr. Adkins um, is, has really been different than a lot of past superintendents is that reading is required at the middle level, no matter what uh, achievement level you have. And we have, um, we have different tiered systems of support based on those achievement levels and it's fluid. So we're constantly watching the data to see if we can bump that kid up to the next reading um, program so that, so we have our core, we have system 44, which is like for students who still have like phonics issues, um, but quickly we move them into read 180 and that works more on, um, which is, was the pro that will be the program that then helps them with like prefixes and suffixes, morphology, um, a lot more vocabulary and comprehension, some fluency, that type of thing. And then we have, um, our supplemental program, iReady then, that basically we do diagnostic tests and it does like individual learning paths. And you're right, Pam, and that um, we too want reading to be taken uh, very seriously at our schools and by our students and for them to understand that, that um, we, we are lifelong learners and reading is an acquired skill. And so as everything changes, the content that we're reading and or the text complexity gets that that we're acquiring um, reading uh, much harder reading, and so we're going to need strategies and support and and instruction to kind of help meet those needs. So I, we totally agree with that. I'm like pro reading uh, all the way. So thank you for that. And then Brian, um, so um, he asked if it's free of any controversial subject matter. So um, they don't, they, um, they look for all that and they have bias committees um, that look for that. And these um, will not make the short bid list without getting through that sensitivity and bias committee. And so um, they vet that prior to us being able to select those vendors. Um, so they, they were reviewed um, prior to that. And then we let them know what they reviewed. And so that conversation doesn't come up uh, in our textbook adoption committees, other than letting them know what the state vetted um, and who made it through those cuts. Um, in April, Pam, I teach the lowest reading daily to English language learners. We are constantly looking at data and how we can help in the classroom. And she teaches System 44 hybrid. I imagine that's challenging um, for English language learners on a hybrid scale. So thank you for doing that, April. So. Um, I guess at this point, usually what we do is is ask if someone is willing to make a motion that um, that you're you're comfortable uh, with the process that we use for textbook adoption and us moving forward to the board um, to allow them to understand the process that we went through and honoring the textbook adoption committee's work. So I'll I'll move that the com that the committee support the process used to select the uh, ELA text. That's basically the language that you need. Thank you, Dr. Wilkerson. And we just need a second, and then all in favor, Marissa. Can I second if I'm on the committee? I'll second. And if everybody would just do a thumbs up or you can live with it. Okay, thank you. And then Dr. Scott, we, um, math is up next. So we're gonna start that like probably looking at that at the end of the year. But uh, one of the things that we really will um, look for guidance from this curriculum advisory is we're really going to have to start ramping up um, educating our teachers on what the best standards are 
um, making sure that there's a lot of professional development. Um, and so um, we would love your involvement in helping plan for, uh, for many teachers. This will be their first time changing standards uh, and make, you know, so um, it's, it's, it's a very heavy lift anytime that our standards change because we want to make sure that, that our kids don't get left behind. Um, so that's very important work and we would love for any committee member to be a part of that work with us. So maybe we could talk a little bit about then how are we, how are we building on this? So as we roll into February, what does this look like then? So as we roll into um, February, now that textbook adoption is over, we'll start planning for, um, and Bethany will has the most urgent planning needs because we have, she has to begin the teaching of this, of the best standards next school year. And then we, at the um, grades three through 12, we stay on the current standards and our students are still assessed on the current standards for this year and next year. And then we switch over to the best standards um, after that year. So the, you know, the timing of us looking at who's getting trained first, um, who, who comes on board next, who gets the, the materials first? Should we wait on some materials until we're actually um, all teaching the lab standards? Those are all decisions that we will be weighing and, um, and looking at that we could talk about at our next meeting if you would like. So in elementary, it gets especially tricky because the best standards, um, like, like Lori said, begin next school year for K to two, but not for three to five. So um, that's a tricky decision when ordering materials for only some grade levels and not the other. And so we really have to work on a good plan for um, pushing out those materials, but then still training three, four, and five on their tested standards versus the standards that will be implemented the following year. Because if we do not do that, those elementary teachers will receive two new textbooks the same year because like Lori said, the following year is math. And that's very frustrating for a teacher to have to get two sets of textbooks um, and learn two sets of um, you know, new textbooks and standards the same year. So um, if everyone agrees for our next meeting, um, we can present on how we are beginning that process with K-2 and then a timeline for how that will continue out um, for the remaining grade levels, as well as the purchasing of the materials and, and how we're training on the textbooks. Okay. Okay, Barissa, was there anything else on the agenda? It was our, looks like our good of the order, I believe. Just trying to get see if it's back up. There we go. All right. So we talked about our action and next steps, and that's going to be how, how our process is going to be about for our K to two versus our uh, three to five, and how this rollout is going to be because it's going to be interesting. Which I'm interested in that because um, now I'm entering the uh, mom role who has kids in school. <laughs> Um, so I, the K is, I'm going to look at it through mom and teacher eyes. Um, so yes, kind of excited about that. Um, and then, yeah, so we have that set, uh, good of the order. Is there any more comments? Is there anything else? Um, if not, we can have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Anyone? Girl, I'll, I'll motion to adjourn. Okay. I second that. Okay, second, so, awesome. And okay. I wanna tell Candace one more time, I'm sorry about your loss. <laughs> harsh, April, harsh. All right, everybody, thank you so much. <laughs>